my friends, brothers and sisters. I wish you blessings from the good Lord and peace to you and to your house on this beautiful evening. I am Father Bob Miller, pastor here at St. Dorothy's Catholic Church in the South Side of Chicago. It's a pleasure to welcome to my house of prayer here and my congregation here. It's a joy for me today to be with you, just to share a few reflections about hope. Hope for the darkness that so marks our world today. Hope for the frustrations and the loneliness and the sin, the shame that pull us apart from God. And we are Christians because of our hope in God. The hope that never changes because God doesn't change. And that's why our hope is secure and steady. I'd like to start off with a scripture passage. Um, again, Catholics need to be reading scripture. We are a Bible-based church. We need to know it and read it and study it and truly get into the Word of God. It's the foundation of our faith life. I want to read a scripture passage today that is a very powerful passage, a very revelatory passage about Paul. Um, touches on a dynamic that infects, and I use that word carefully, infects many of us, a deep inner discontent and shame. This is a re good reflection of Paul here. This is the seventh chapter going into the eighth. Quote, I know that no good dwells in me that is in my flesh. The desire to do right is there, but not the power. So what happens is that I do not the good I want to do, but the evil I do not intend. My inner self agrees with the law of God. But I see in my body's members another law at work with the law of my mind, and that makes me a prisoner of the law of sin that dwells in my members. What a wretched man I am. Who can free me from this body under the power of death? All praise to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit, the Spirit of life in Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. My friends, I wanted to share that scripture to start off today because it touches something that touches so many, many of us Christians, good Christians, as well as people who don't even know Jesus. There's this problem of sin and shame. Let's just go into this a little bit. Let's just talk about God and, and us. Um, what keeps us from God? Let's just start with that. What keeps you from God? What, what makes prayer hard and your faith life difficult? Well, as, as I look at myself, I know one of the things that does it for me is there's outer things. You know, some days I'm tired and some days I'm weary. and Some days I just don't feel like praying sometimes, you know. Then there's the stresses of life financial stresses, relationship troubles, uh, job troubles, you know, unforgiveness, control, a lot of outer things can pull our relationship with God. But I've also discovered, as I'm sure you have too, that for we who know the Lord, there are inner forces that can pull us away from the God of love and mercy and compassion and power. There's inner things like fear, anxiety, control, and unhealthy shame. And that's what we want to talk about tonight. This sense of inadequacy and being a failure, utter insecurity that plagues us no matter how successful we are on the outside. You can be an enormously successful, prosperous person, very confident, very courageous, very bold, but still be plagued on the inside by nagging feelings of shame. Let's just make a distinction right at the beginning. Uh, not all shame is bad. Let's get that very clear. There's healthy shame and there's unhealthy shame. Healthy shame is the sense of saying, I made a mistake and I can repair that. I mean, isn't that normal for human behavior? Part of human Christianity is recognizing that we are sinners. We've made a mistake. We can go to God for forgiveness and move forward in our life. We should have a healthy sense of shame about those kinds of things or about how we present ourselves or dress or things like that. But there is an unhealthy shame as well. And unhealthy shame is this. It's not, I made a mistake and I can repair it. Unhealthy shame is, I am a mistake. I am a mistake. There's something wrong with me at my core. I'm flawed. I'm not enough. And that is called toxic shame because it's deadly. And it's from the evil one. It's the one who loves to push on us and lie to us. It's a lie, basically, intended to pull us away from the goodness 
compassion and love of our Father to pull us away from the truth of what God made us to be. Now, let's talk about this a little bit today. Why is this kind of unhealthy shame so toxic, so deadly? For several reasons. First of all, and psychologists have shown this, toxic shame develops so early in life some 18 to 24 months, we can start feeling this sense of, I am a mistake. They tell us we don't even start experiencing guilt, really, until we're three or four years old. But toxic shame starts so early. Number two, it comes from the people that we're closest to, our most beloved family members, more than likely our parents, our family systems. It comes from them. No family is perfect. Your parents weren't perfect. My parents weren't perfect. They were not able to be perfect parents. So we sometimes pick up that unhealthy sense of shame from them who inherited it from their parents. So it goes so deep into our intimate parts of our life. Number three, it becomes so pervasive and invasive. What, what, what does an infection do in your body, right? Wipes out your whole body. And that's what shame does. It touches every part of your life, your intimate relationships touches your family life, it touches work life, even touches our prayer and our spiritual life. We have whole movements of the history we could talk about where the whole concept of approaching God was, I am a sinner. Literally one great man, John Calvin, said human beings are dung covered with snow that God comes in and blesses. So this whole concept of shame affects every part of our life. And lastly, we're unconscious of it. Maybe the most serious of all, we don't even know what's going on. There's something low grade, eh, we don't feel right about ourselves. We don't feel good about it, but we don't even know and can't put our fingers on what it is. We're in denial and we're in blindness. Now, let's just put this into context, shall we? Talk about God. There's an understanding. When you look at the scriptures, when you look at the Word of God, you understand there's two forces that are competing for your soul. Two forces that want us on their side. One, of course, is God, the force of good. And the other is the force of evil, the force of shame. And these two are competing. They're fighting for our attention. They're wrestling for authority over every part of our life. Whether it's our emotions or our consciousness or our behavior, they want to control us. They want to hold on to us. And the challenge is for us to become aware of it, moving out of the darkness into the light. What does John say, Gospel of John? You will know the truth. Now, what does the truth do? Set you free. A friend of mine once added a phrase that says, the truth will set you free, but it'll make you miserable first. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that because it upsets you. It forces you to face things we don't usually say. So to the extent that we are unaware of what shame does, we get stuck. And that is why our society today is so stuck today. We are horribly stuck in our political world right now. People can't even talk to each other. Political parties can't even talk to each other. We're stuck in our relationships because we're unaware of the forces that are motivating us down below from the evil one. Now, the, the force of God, the force of the Lord, is an integrating force. The force of shame, the power of the evil one, is a disintegrating force. Stop and think about that. What is God all about? God is bringing together God wants to unite and make us one. God wants to connect us. So connect us to our intrinsic goodness. Connect us to other people. Connect us to the world around us. God wants to liberate us from anything that holds us back from the fullness of what we were meant to be. God wants to make whole, make one. That's God's clear intention all the way through the Bible. God wants to ultimately do that, not so we can feel good about ourselves, but so we can go out and infect the world with the good news. And in fact, look at the Bible, John chapter 17, verse 21, one of the best scriptures I remember. John 17, 21, Father says, Jesus says, Father, may they be one as we are one. That's God's goal. And you know the Bible in the New Testament. Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. However, the power of evil does the opposite. It pulls apart disintegrates minds, pulls us apart from our relationships, makes our interpersonal life miserable. Relationships are miserable. It cripples our creativity and sense of discovery. 
You know, we were born with a healthy creativity and, and oftentimes that's sheltered and shadowed and pushed down. Don't, be, don't go out, don't explore, be careful, don't hurt anybody. So this creates a very fear of vulnerability. Because we're ashamed, we have the shame in us, we hide, don't we? I don't want to let people know, so we dress nice, put our collars on, put our makeup on, look very good because we want anybody to see the truth about us. Now I want to just narrow down what the evil one does in here. We've got to recognize our enemy here. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. So let me just run through a few of the features of shame that are very prominent in part of our life. Number one, shame affects every level of our being, as I've said before, with the sense that I am not enough, I am less than, I always fall short. So it affects our personalities, it affects us ethnically. As ethnic groups, it enhances our sense of prejudice against us. It makes it even greater. We emphasize that. It, it weakens our sense of goodness of who we are. Shame, the result is what happens is we isolate ourselves. When we're afraid to be seen for who we are because we don't like what we see, what do we do? We pull back. We isolate ourselves. We don't want to be part of groups or situations that we can be revealed. So we develop a, a, a false self. And unfortunately, I'm, you're all well aware of it. Look at some of our great, great political and even spiritual leaders who we thought were great spiritual people, and I'm sure they were, touched many people. All of a sudden, a whole dark side comes out because they're unaware, they're living a lie. And that's what evil one does. Is build a, a life script that we live by without being honest with what he's doing as he works in the foundations of our life. Shame has a very demeaning voice. It just helps put us down and, and push us on the brink of utter despair and worry and loneliness and fear at times. So I want to just help us be aware of what evil does because it pulls us apart. Let me just share, I've been sharing ideas. Can I just share a little bit of my own story? very quickly and very briefly too, there's nobody listening to me today who's not somehow been touched by shame in your life. I came from a marvelous family, born and raised in Michigan, mother and dad, good loving people, um, uh, solid Catholic people, um, great loving people. We were in church, I had three siblings all the time, siblings with me, we were in church. So I grew up with a beautiful family, Greg, and they're both there for me. What a blessing it was. But I look back on it now, and it was a culture of what I would call perfection. Perfection. I had to be perfect. I had to be better all the time. If I did something good, I could do it better. So I developed a mentality of always do it better, always do it better. What I was doing was not quite good enough. It was okay, but you could do better. So I was constantly, ceaselessly pushing and pushing and pushing. So there's a sense of a ceaselessness about my activity constantly trying to improve and move forward. Nothing wrong with that, but out of a motivation of there's something not quite right with you, you gotta keep on working till you get it right. A few years ago, when I began to really read on shame and pray through what was holding me back from the Lord, I was in prayer one day and suddenly it dawned on me something my mother had said to me for years and I had completely blocked it out. When little Bobby was a bad boy, years ago, my mom used to say to me, shame on you, shame on you, and I believed it. I believed it, I internalized that, and I took that shame on me. There was something wrong with me. And I didn't realize I even blocked out that she said that to me. That's very much part of my background. I went into seminary at 14. Uh, nobody goes into seminary at 14 anymore today, but I went at 14 trying to seek what I felt was the Lord at that time, and of course it was a long, long journey where I was. Seminary was great in many ways, taught me so much, but it really reinforced a strong sense of sin in my life, that I was a sinner. Now, there's nothing wrong with realizing we're a sinner. We need to realize that. But I was in confession every single Saturday, confessing my sins and never quite felt relief past the first few minutes when I left the confessional there. So in the religious life, I learned a whole different way of living. You had to be pure. You had to be sinless to meet the goal of the founder of our order. We used to have a saying in religious life, keep the rule and the rule will keep you. Well, how did that work out? <laughs> None of us is perfect. 
and I didn't always keep it well either, which reinforced a sense of guilt and fear even more. So I learned a certain sense of expectations. I think this what happens to a lot of us here. We learn a sense of expectation. God doesn't want to be disappointed. Don't disappoint God. Don't disappoint other people. Don't disappoint your parents. You know, those are all subtle expectations that get put on us. Now, I just want to flesh out a little bit of my picture. Maybe something in there rang true with you. Because I was successful on the outside. I was ordained. I was a priest. I smile. I get along. People seem to like me. I preach well. But deep inside, there's a core that is still unsettled. Can you relate to that? That's how the evil one works. He creeps in. He's subtle. He's a liar. He's an accuser. He tricks us. He likes to work here. But I don't want to spend any more time on shame. The important reason I spent time doing that is so you can recognize it. You know and where it is in your life. Now let's talk about the sense of freedom that I found in Jesus. That's why I read the scripture from Romans. What a beautiful scripture it was. When I first read it and read into that, I really found tremendous freedom. Listen to what Paul says here. What a wretched man I am. Who can free me from this body under the power of sin? Can you relate to that? You struggle with things. How can I get rid of this pattern? That's what Paul's saying. But then he says, all praise to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He recognizes where freedom comes from. He recognizes where his identity comes from. And then the next sentence is so powerful for us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I want you to say those words to yourself right now. And I want you to believe them. There's no condemnation for me. No condemnation when you're in Christ Jesus. That's what God does. When you come into God and open yourself up completely and totally, God comes in and moves in a powerful, freeing way. The love of the Father eases that sense of drivenness and guilt and fear. Jesus sets you free from unnecessary scruples and fears and worries. He gives you a sense of hope and joy and freedom and a bigger vision and destiny in life. That there's so many people out there that need to hear the good news of Jesus the freedom of Jesus, that we can obsess on our own weaknesses and shortcomings. And in the end, when I get up in the pulpit on Sunday morning, that's what's the most important thing to me. I never get up in that pulpit, frankly, without feeling a little fear and shame and guilt. Who am I to be speaking to these people? I never do that. But you know what's more important? I don't care what anybody thinks about me. It's more important that God's Word gets spoken. And that's the same for you. No matter what you're struggling with right now, it doesn't matter in God's eyes. Bring it to the Lord. Ask for help. Seek help. Ask forgiveness if you need it. But it's more important that you tell somebody what a mighty God we serve, what a good God we serve. And that's the gift of our faith, the love of the Father that sets us free, the power of Jesus that gives us hope and the joy and the passion of the Spirit. As we begin to wrap up these reflections let me just give you a couple thoughts to hang with. As you continue to deal with shame in your life, I want you to be open to that. Three things I want you to focus on. Discovery, uncovery, recovery. Number one, discovery. Recognize shame. Learn to recognize those negative voices. That there is a battle going on. The devil wants you. Recognize how he's working on you. Number two, take the mask off of anything that you may not want to face in yourself and recognize that's the battlefield. What is your shame story? Everybody has a unique shame story. Don't hide, don't run from it. You have to unveil it. Let God come in, be known to God, and fr frankly, be known to at least one other person. And then lastly, recovery. Return to the source. Return to the one who created you, not as a shameful person, not as a guilty person, but as beautiful in the eyes of God. Now, as we wrap up, would, would you be willing to pray with me just a little bit? I don't want to speak on the lies anymore. I want to speak on the truth. So I'll just, just pray with you a little prayer that speaks of the truths of what God says about you, the truth of his love. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Precious Lord God, we go back to Jesus' baptism today and we remember at Jesus' baptism that you said, you are my beloved son 
my beloved daughter. That is truth. We are broken people. We are weak, yes. But we are beautiful because God has chosen us. That is the truth. Romans 10, verse 1. Anyone who trusts in the Lord will never be put to shame. When you come to the Lord Jesus, you lay it at the altar, give it to Jesus, shame is taken away, guilt taken away, resentment taken away. We are freed when we come and stand under the cross of Jesus. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Jesus that lives in me. The truth is, Jesus is in us right now. May Jesus be magnified in you right now. You and I no longer live. I pray that Jesus lives in you and grows more and more each and every day. John 8, 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Lord, I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice can hear your truth and know that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Help us develop ears that can recognize the lies of the evil one the trickery of the evil one, the accusing voice of the evil one, the separateness that the evil one would do. Let us recognize those as a lie and return to the blessing that God made us to be. And finally, the last truth, John, the third chapter, the 17th verse, Jesus came not to condemn the world. Jesus did not come to condemn you, to condemn me. He came that through him, we might be saved. Come, Lord Jesus, save us. Set us free that we can be used by you to bring good news to all the world. And I ask this prayer in all prayers, in the name and under the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you, and have a great night. someone who's uh, used media a lot in evangelization, so I believe in the importance of Catholic radio, Catholic TV, Catholics using the new media. Can I encourage everyone to watch Home TV? I think it's a great vehicle of evangelization. And God bless all of you. Shalom World, God's own channel.